I mean, how old were you when you like caught your first snake in the wild? Probably like five years old. Uh, my dad kind of helped with that a little bit too, because uh, he lived up in PA, and so like on the mountains they would go like find snakes under rocks, and so uh, it was probably like a ringneck snake. We'd go up to Pennsylvania and flip rocks at uh, his uncle's mountain house, and so very very young, probably like five or six. Now, when you were that young, did you guys have snakes in the house yet? No. Uh, my first snake, I believe, was at eight years old. That was like a that was a corn snake. And when did you decide that, I, I assume that you probably had a larger, you grew a population of non-venomous over time. Did you, did you ever do that? I mean, Yeah, um, so that was probably up until I was like 16. I go to different Repticons or have different uh, friends and shows that I would go to. So I would own reticulated pythons, carpet pythons, sunbeam snakes, um, Amazon tree boas, uh, different unique or colubrids, like, cal like high white, um, California king snakes, uh, all sorts of stuff. And, but generally that would be, uh, just because I was in high school and I was very busy at the time, I didn't want a ton, so I would keep no more than like four or five. Sometimes you'd trade, it's really weird, but sometimes it's like Pokemon cards. Like you have this one you really like, but that's, keeping, that's staying with you forever, and then sometimes you trade this one out or you, or you sell that one, buy some more. And so it probably stayed under like five animals throughout, and it, some of those would swap out and change. When did you make the transition to Venomous? So Venomous was uh, just before I started to go to college when I was around 17. Uh, that was like the first time that I had really owned Venomous. Uh, prior to that, I think around 11 or 12 was when I had my first experience with Venomous, and that was like a copperhead. Um, and so I would always go out and you would look for copperheads or cottonmouths. There are a lot of the local Venomous that are in North Carolina. Uh, we have six species total, and really all throughout North Carolina they can be found. And so I had experience with the animals before, but I had never really dove or gotten into the world of owning venomous. Um, and in 17 was when I had first snake. Uh, that had only lasted for probably three months. Um, and then after that, I had college. Uh, so that snake was sold. And then, I mean, on the, this webcast you did, I mean, you talked about having to convince your parents that once you came back into the house that, you know, yeah. I think I want to get into this venomous thing. How'd that go? So that was actually, originally I had moved out. Uh, when I came back from college, I moved out. I was working full time um, and I was at an apartment. Um, but at that apartment, uh, first snake that I had kept long term or really until the collection was gone was uh, an albino monocled cobra. Um, she was in a Neodesha locked labeled single cage, my single cobra, that was all I had. And my parents would have felt more comfortable if it was at their house as well. Uh, we had a lot of space in the basement. Um, and they didn't like the idea of me owning Venomous at first. Um, but I was full legal adult on my own, so they said you can do what you want. But we had both agreed it'd be better if it was at the house. And once I saw the enclosure um, and that I had already had adequate experience and worked with um, a lapids uh, and cobras and many of those types of snakes at that time that they were okay with it coming back to the house. Um, by the time that our lease was up, uh, instead of getting an apartment again, since I had gained much more of an interest into the ownership of Venomous now, uh, we decided to move back in, uh, pay rent with them, which was much cheaper, and I had actual space to facilitate all these animals. So how quickly did the did, did your, did your uh, it was it was definitely slower at first yeah. because every because I still was under their roof every snake was a, a discussion uh, build my case this is why it's okay buy the enclosure first have everything set up first and then go through with it um, and so it started out at a pretty steady pace um, I'd say every month and a half uh, I'd probably get like a snake or a pair of snakes in. Now, how many, you talked earlier about, you know, you, you bring some in, raise them, and then resell them. I mean, how many, did you have some that were part of your, like, permanent collection that you just kept yeah. the whole time? So I had about 35 that was permanent collection. Those were just the animals that I was keeping that I either personally loved a lot or that I would um, plan on breeding. So, like, I had sharp nose vipers, um, eastern green mambas, uh, hairy, or Harold the snouted cobra. Those are just animals that I personally loved. Um, and the, there was never really the intention of getting into buying and selling. It was more so that I love these animals and I can share these animals on social media. Um, this is the, they're fascinating to people. Some people are terrified, but I have the ability to show them that these animals really aren't as bad as most people think. Um, 
and it wasn't until I would buy certain lots of animals that I was like, oh, we have, these are like big at shows. If I can make money from something that I enjoy while making connections as well, I can do that. So it wasn't until probably 2021, beginning of that year, that I had really started to buy larger groups to become a vendor at shows. I mean, one of the things, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you've heard it plenty over the past, you know, year or so. I mean, a lot of people will see your videos. You talk about some people are fascinated, some people are terrified. Yeah. You know, the question that you always get is, I mean, why would you need to own these types of snakes? Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. It's, it seems dangerous. It seems scary. It seems terrifying. Um, I mean, why would I go snowboarding? Why would I go cliff jumping? Why would I go skydiving? Why would I do all these other dangerous activities? Uh, there are a lot of things that we do out of our control, and there are so many people. I mean, you'll see snake accounts with 2.1 million followers. These animals are beautiful. I mean, we own pets, and the reason that it is so controversial to people is, I mean, sometimes you see somebody with a bearded dragon, and they don't have that same question, or a ball python, it's not that same question, or maybe it may be, but most fear just comes from a lack of knowledge. I've been around these animals my whole lives. I know how, to me, they're, they're beautiful. They're fascinating, they're intrinsic. There's nothing about them that I don't love. So it's something that I've always had a passion for and I have an ability to pursue it. I do that. Everybody has weird talents or hobbies or things that they pursue, uh, some of which can be dangerous. Snakes can be very dangerous. I've had firsthand experiences with that. Um, and so, the passion has never left my heart and there would be no reason for me to suppress that. Why own it? Uh, because we love the animals. There were some animals that were so rare that they were only um, less than a thousand in captivity, Mangshans, and I got those captive bred from Germany. Eventually I could do a breeding project and help out with the, with the in-house survival of a species. That's insane to me. That was the coolest thing ever. There was nothing that was not awesome about what I was doing. I mean, you mentioned earlier that hey, you've always been an adrenaline junkie. Yes but owning these pets to you is about more than adrenaline. I mean, they're pets to you. If you were doing this for an adrenaline rush and every situation is dangerous, that's not good. Um, there are a lot of times where sometimes it'll look very sensational or scary with a video. But this is a snake I've been working with for months. Um, this isn't something you do for a rush and wow, I'm scared. You shouldn't be having a high amount of close calls. There are proper ways, protocols, and safe things that you can do to go about owning these reptiles. Um, some species, it is a completely hands-off snake. A lot of the Western Diamondbacks and certain rattlesnake species, my hand never touches them. I use a hook. A lot of these smaller arboreal vipers, there's no reason to get hands-on. You just hook them in, hook them out. Um, locks, labels about going in when you're cleaning your enclosures. I mean, you always have a second receptacle to put this animal in so you are fully safe. The adrenaline part, that's more so um, with crazy things like snowboarding or cliff jumping and free diving. There isn't necessarily a rush I get working with the animals, mm -hmm. but there is just this intrinsic feeling of, wow, this, this thing has the potential to kill me and it has no desire in the world to do so. I mean, so the videos that you push out there, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, yeah. Facebook, I mean, your goal with those is not to show people, hey, look how cool I am that I can handle this dangerous snake. I mean, you you like to use these videos to educate people in your mind, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of times it's information on the animal. Sometimes it's a clip that I've just personally liked or enjoyed. There are, a lot of, there are people that go about a lot better doing it, fully informational, but I also like being a storyteller. Um, it's something that's always been my personality. I do love talking with people. I do love showing, hey, look at this. Uh, there's a big difference between having a snake in a bin and giving facts about it versus hands-on and saying, look, I could tell you that this won't attack me, but now I'm showing you, hand in hand. I just done a video down in Florida. Um, Cottonmouth is one of the most notorious snakes out there. They're known for chasing people. This is the one where you're laying next to it on the street? I have tons of videos like yeah, that. I, I will do video after video, and I have five more of those videos with each different snakes, and I'm sitting on there, and they've just, I've had them crawl right over my foot. And so I like to show people versus just tell them. What were some of the, the structural features you had to make sure that yeah. these animals were kept enclosed. So in that basement, well, you, we can pull it back to Article 55. That's most of the laws regarding venomous snakes. Um, obviously, I had a huge fallacy with one of these, which was failure to report. Um, but you have to have a written uh, escape plan. That means if there's going to be a fire, if there's going to be an earthquake or hurricane, so escape plan and containers for every snake. And that's how it happens. Um, after that, it's bite-proof and escape-proof enclosures, uh, which must have a locking mechanism on it. Then you have to have it labeled 
the snake species, uh, the common name, the Latin name, how many are in it, and generally what antivenin it uses. Um, so all the snakes that I had, uh, most of them were sliding glass doors, um, and they would have a metal lock on it. Um, some were internal cam locks, so it would key directly into the lock, and it internally mm -hmm. locked with that with metal. Um, so all the enclosures, escape proof. That's first measure. Um, secondary thing is you have to have a lot of proper tools. You have to have secondary containment measures. Um, now, as far as structurally, the housing. Um, that, so it was in our basement, and we had two doors, both of which had sweeps underneath. And we do had vents that came directly in. So we'd put wire grates, like very, very fine wire, um, on each of the grates. And we had two piping units that came in and went under. But there were cracks around that. So once we got venomous snakes in, one of the biggest things was like, my mom was more so on the side of, we don't want this. My dad was like, well, I like snakes, but it's a bad idea, and I love your mother. Um, and so we had to foolproof that room first for me to have anything. And that was caulking around all those cracks. Um, and then the written escape plan as well. Um, clearly, out of a fear-based reaction, I did not go about it how I wanted to. Also, bite protocols. For each snake, uh, you have to have more than the knowledge of just how to handle it. Um, I need to know what I'm going to do if I get bit by a mamba versus if there were to be a bite with a cobra or with anything else. They have different venoms. They have neurotoxic, cytotoxic, hemotoxic, cardiotoxins. You have to know what to do in that situation and as well to who to call. So there was a bite plan as well and a bite protocol for each snake. That's to handle, hand to medical staff or for whoever's there with you um, in case of a bite. And those were, that sums up most of the precautionary measures with owning the animals. So in your mind, that basement was sealed. Yeah, 100%. Nothing, nothing was getting out. Not to my, not to my knowledge. No, not a thing. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move in. Let's move on to the the cobra. So you bought two. Yes. You, you had you had a you had a bigger one. You mentioned that was later on. Later on. Yep. So the snake that I actually got out, um, I had bought two. I bought a male and a female baby. They were probably maybe a month old. I mean, these guys were. So eight and nine inches, if that, probably seven to eight. Really small guys. Um, obviously, at that time, uh, how, it was How November. thick were they at that point, would you say? Probably about the size of a pencil. Um, very small. And so at that point, we had, uh, or I had probably a $15,000 collection. Um, a lot of personal snakes there, none that were really going out for sale or anything of that nature. And when you get any new snakes into it, a collection. They can carry viral infections, they can carry bacterial, they can carry respiratory infections, which is uh, due to, which can travel very fast. They can carry mites. There are a ton of possible dangers. And so if you introduce that directly into your collection, put it right on the rack with everything else, other animals could get sick. Quarantine means they're not going immediately into their permanent enclosure. Um, the enclosure that they're generally going to go into is something that's temporary, very clear and very manageable. For me, uh, we would use quarantine tubs, pretty common in the hobby. Um, that is on paper towels, a hide, and a bowl, and the size of the tub, depending on what snake you're going into, or depending on what size snake is going into it. Um, since these guys were super small, uh, they were a little larger than six quart, um, and it was latching on both ends with a seal around. Um, this is something that I had used pretty regularly with quarantining for a lot of animals. The part where the big question of how to get out came into play was one of those tubs, um, if you turn it to the side and you have that latch that pops and in. And you now, you, now you got these, you put them in the bins, and yes. you quarantined them. I mean, this was the first night, right? Yeah. So tell Literally me about that. First so night. the first day you got them, you, you lock them up, you put them. Set them in, um, put them in, make sure they're good, check them out, make sure they're hydrated, put them in, and there was a rack on the other side of the room. Uh, put these animals on those rack, and generally every morning I do a checkup on all my animals. Check every enclosure, leave no stone unturned. And when I came back that next morning to check on one of those tubs, it's not under the hide, not under the paper towel, not in the water barrel. This giant oh crap moment. Um, this snake's not here. And that was when I had learned that on that other side of that tub um, was a crack. It was either brittle or that tub at some point had been dropped. But where that latch is supposed to stay secure on the bottom, it was loose, and that lid was able to pop up, and that was something that I should have 100% full-blown checked. And I guess that day I hadn't. So you said it was an oh crap moment. Yes. Take me through the next, gosh, not even, I can't even say a couple hours, because I mean, you, you guys spent weeks. Yeah, immediately, immediately just 
frantic searching, just checking everywhere and anywhere. Now this species is a spitting cobra. Uh, the toxins are generally just cytotoxic, which causes necrosis. Um, at this size and its demeanor, these are very shy snakes. They don't want anything to do with people. Um, I wasn't necessarily worried about getting a bite. Uh, first thing is get on glasses in case it does defensively spit, because they will do that at times. I get my shoes on and I just start sweeping through everything in the entire tire basement. 30 minutes in, uh, my brain goes, holy cow, I need, to know, I need to let my parents know. I'm not worried. I know for a fact that it should be in this room. So there weren't concerns about that, but I did want help. So I go upstairs, tell my father, hey, really bad news. Worst nightmare just came true, really. Um, he comes down and we start searching for hours. I called off work and we just start moving everything around in this room. Cannot find it. Um, so after about six or seven hours comes nighttime, we cut on all the lights, put on the lights in the backyard. We start securing every snake that's in an enclosure, searching through the substrate and all enclosures, and we take every item that was in that basement, piece by piece, out of the basement into our backyard. This had gone into the next morning. By that time, um, when we had removed everything from the basement, there's one hole that we had missed throughout setting all this up, and that was when I used to game down there, I would also have a uh, PS4, and I had an Ethernet cable hole that we had drilled through the wall. At that current time, that Ethernet cable was not there. That hole was about the size of a pin. Um, that hole went directly into the crawl space and into the drywall. If anything, that was a sigh of relief. I'm like, this thing's not going anywhere. It is still remaining in this house. Because when you check that whole room and it's not there, that's a no crap moment. I mean, so that hole, didn't, didn't, that hole in itself didn't give the snake access to outside. No. It, so it was still in the house enclosure. Yeah. From what we had, yeah, still in the house, in the, which went into the crawl space. But the crawl space has vents and graded covers on every single side. Um, and so at that point, we kept the enclosures out, kept all the snakes in temporary tubs. Um, and at that point, it was a waiting game. And this, had, and this was, just to make sure we got the, this was November 30. No, 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 November 31st was the day it got out. Yep. At okay. that point, we smoked. And you've gone to the next day. So yes, December this is 1st. next day now. So we had, at this point, um, bombed the basement with chemicals, set up cameras. And to my knowledge, my parents at this time, a, a, a discussion broke out. We need to call the authorities. Um, this is something that we need to do immediately. That was terrifying for me. Um, this entire situation was a nightmare. I have no idea if all my animals are going to be taken. Um, I knew that this was a law, but I didn't know what repercussions were going to happen. Um, and the side of the more biological part came in for the play of, in theory, if the snake ever got out, it is now December 1st. Temperatures are incredibly low. This is a very, very delicate snake in the sense of this is a South African species of animal, or West African, that is a, a lapid. They need to eat 24-7. Uh, they, they have such a fast metabolism. They are very sensitive to what humidity is going to be put in there. They can get respiratory infections. They can very easily die from the cold, as well as this is North Carolina. There's no way this thing would ever survive outside. And that was my, biggest, my parents' biggest concern, and mine as well, if this thing gets out. If this thing gets out, it's surely dead. If it stays in the house, it might live a little longer to the warmth. My mom was full blown on we need to call somebody. My dad was a little bit more in the middle. And because I was scared, uh, I convinced them that I don't think we need to make this call. I think this thing should be dead. Um, but this was just two days in. And so for those first two weeks, it was still searching every day. We set up cameras in the basement, cameras in the crawl space, nothing. And at this point, it was a this snake is also a little bit fossorial. Fossorial means they're the ground, they like to burrow more than the average snake. They like to burrow, they like to be in the ground. And this crawl space is a, is a clay crawl space full of tons of little different pockets of mud. I wasn't even sure it got into the crawl space because in between these two, there's a hole on one side, a hole on the other, and it's just drywall right there. I'd assume there's a chance this thing just got in the drywall, can't go anywhere, and it's curled up dead. Um, it needs to eat a lot, it needs very specific temperatures. There's no way this thing survived. Um, after about three or four weeks of consistently searching, at this point we had put the enclosures back in, set up cameras behind everything. We had already chemicaled in the basement. And the unfortunate part is if it did die, it curled up in a hole and died. And if it got outside, it's curled up now cold in a ball and dead. 
um, there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of contemplation over do we make this call over the next few months. I hadn't had a stellar relation, or I hadn't had any relationship with animal control about at this time. Um, I was terrified. It was just nerve wrenching, just thinking the entire time, not being able to know that the snake is dead, but being so sure that it would die. Um, it just couldn't survive North Carolina's temperatures or anything. And as more time passed, Anxiety you started eases. leaning toward yeah. it's definitely dead. Oh, 100%. Every day that I'd pass by, you would think about it, but then you'd be like, okay, it's now 28 degrees out. It's freezing. It's dead. Um, and then up until... we had until, two snows that January? I believe we might have had two. It may have been just one. Just one. But we had had a snow. It's dead. No, no concern at that point. By the time that... Well, actually, there was still concern in January, even with the snow. There's anxiety there, but... I was pretty sure that this animal had died. Um, and I thought it had died in my house, in the crawl space, or in our drywall. Um, I wasn't concerned necessarily for the family's aspect. I'd, I've been, like I said, I've been around these snakes for a while. This thing is, does not want to deal with anybody. Anytime that you have these baby animals, their first reaction is, I'm trying to get the heck away. Um, and so month after month after month, up until we had discovered that it was not dead, by the end of it, it was, almost off my mind. These months pass, you're assuming it's dead, all of a sudden animal control gets a phone call from a homeowner that mm -hmm. found a weird snake at their house, yep. took a picture of it, animal control gets an expert, and what do they say? Uh, they deem that it is a zebra spinning cobra. At this point, animal control knew I had my animals. Uh, they had come by, they had verified that everything was good and Article 55 compliant. Um, they had done checkups before, everything was fine. And so on they just come by on a do, regular do day. Do you have to report if you get a new species no. every time? Or it's no. just more random they do, checks? They do random checkups. Check okay. um, as long as I keep everything compliant, Article 55, when they had checked everything, everything was good, locked, labeled. Um, so they, you don't have to report each snake. There are no permits for each snake. Uh, the only four snakes that you can't own in North Carolina is the Eastern Diamondback, the Coral Snake, uh, Pygmy, and the Timber. Those are the only four things you can't own that you need a very, very difficult permit to acquire. And so all my stuff was legal. And they come by to do a checkup, looking at all the animals. Everything's fine. Um, or you then, think it's just a standard checkup? I think it's a standard checkup. And she tells me after, this is the real reason I'm here, pulls out her phone. And lo and behold, it is a picture of, for sure, a zebra spitting cobra that has now grown about five to eight inches of when I had lost mine. And immediately, oh crap moment. I just, a gut-wrenching feeling of there's, there's no way. There, there's no way it could have been possible. And she goes, this was found about three streets over. I think like under a quarter of a mile from my house in the neighborhood. Um, and the reason that they knew to come to my house is because they already knew I was probably the only one in that area that would have had a zebra spitting cobra. Um, and throughout the time, she was asking what happened to this snake or that snake um, uh, because I did have an adult female. She was massive. She was seven foot. It actually was the mother of that baby. Um, but I had already sold those snakes by then. And she asked me, is this snake yours? I was petrified. I did not know what to do. I was scared. I didn't know what the precautions were going to be, and none of this was an excuse. Uh, immediately, I said, no idea. Um, she asked a little bit more. And, and how old are you now? I am 22 now. So were you 20 or 19 then, or 21 then? I was 21. 21 then, okay. 21. And I was, I was terrified. Um, and she goes to leave the property. Um, immediately, I made a call to somebody who was very close friends with the animal control agent that came by. Uh, she said to call this number if you have any thoughts changed. And before she had left the property, I very convicted. I was just, I can't, there's no way I can lie about this, um, especially if I'm going to tout that I'm Christian or anything like that. How can I sit here with this giant lie on my conscience? And I was like, I, I need to take heat for this. I messed up big time. This thing is still out there. And so I immediately called her. Uh, she came back to the house, and I gave the full story. What was that like to have to admit that? I, I was already gut-wrenchingly sad that this thing had lived. I mean, that, that's terrible. Um, I, 
even though there was such a low chance that anything would have happened due to how s skittish these things are of people, it was on a lady's porch. Um, imagine if a little kid or something of that nature had happened. It, it was the most horrendous thing that ever happened. An escape was already terrifying enough, but then to know that an animal that you were supposed to tout responsibility of and due to your mistake and not making a call is out, I mean, I was in tears. This is the worst thing that ever happened, as well as there's gonna be trouble, but the trouble wasn't on my mind. It's like, how could I have messed up this bad and this big? And it was like a nightmare that had came back from the past. I thought that that nightmare was over, and it wasn't. What, what did that whole episode teach you? If you're gonna handle these animals, and it is gonna be a high risk situation, or things may happen, honestly, it's a maturity thing. You need to take the humility of, hey, I messed up. If I would have made that call, and not been scared and not been so worried. Everything that I was doing was legal. There probably would have been, thank you for making this call. There would have been a lot of still upset people, but that doesn't matter. It was just the right thing to do. If you make a hiccup, you have to be accountable for that. And I was young and terrified. I still am young and terrified um, about the whole situation. And so what I learned is, is you make the calls. You, you keep yourself accountable, which I didn't do. Obviously, the community was nuts they when this happy. thing was spited, uh, spotted and before it was captured. Yeah. Um, you took a, plenty of, of heat for that and still do. I, to tell me about uh, that a little bit. I had people messaging me every day to go kill myself, that my parents should be in jail. Um, I really couldn't leave the house for a few weeks. I had people threatening to come beat me up, um, people that would drive by our house every single day, um, people telling me that I'm like a worthless idiot, I should be in jail. I mean, think about like the worst comments that you could brew up, and I would get like a hundred or more of those every day. Even just today, I posted, um, I, I saw three comments today. Uh, you're an idiot, you deserve to get bit. You're the guy who let the, keep, let the zebra cobra out. I mean, I have not stopped getting comments for, I think it's what been, August was I'm good, so I have not stopped getting comments every single day for 10 months. It's pretty, uh, pretty rough. I don't mind getting the hate, um, I messed up. There was a reason people were mad and scared. I totally get it. Uh, but now is the time that I can give more clarity to the situation. It's about to be on that uh, anniversary coming soon of when this happened. Um, so I think it'd be good not only to tell my side of the story a little bit, but also give a huge apology. There were never any intentions of doing this. This was, this was of no benefit to anybody. Um, I regret it horrendously, and I wish that I could have change that outcome. This was, these are animals that I love. Uh, this is an animal community is one that I love. There's so many good, responsible, great keepers out there. And because of my stupid mistake, I made that look bad for all of them. Um, I damaged one thing that I love the most, honestly. And so to be able to come out there and clarify a little bit of the situation, um, mostly this is just an apology because there are no excuses for what happened, just explanations for my stupidity.